We are in a series called God Space, and uh, when I think about that, that name, God Space, my mind goes to our life group that, that I was in this week, and one of the men was sharing his God story, how God had been working in his life, a uh, lot of ups and downs, uh, a tough, tough upbringing, but over the last couple of years, the Lord has really gotten a hold of this young man's life, and he's been doing great in his um, marriage and in his relationship uh, with the Lord. Uh, but it was interesting what he said uh, in the story. He pointed to one of the men in the room and he said, but I want to credit him and what the Lord has done through him, my friend here, and how God has used him in my life. Because more than anybody else, like more than you know, my parents who weren't there for me, more than anybody in my life, that guy right there and, and, and it was just so amazing to see that connection and that testimony, how right in that room there was that, that friend who was such a great example. For, and then that man said, well, I can't take any of the credit. There have been men in my life. And I know a little bit about that guy's story. And he had a really hard upbringing in foster care system and how there have been some godly men there for him. And so I was thinking about those stories there uh, that I heard with my own ears there in that life group, and I was reminded of something that's, that's incredibly simple but, but very profound, and how God changes lives, how God does his work in this world, how God accomplishes his plan, is through people. And, and I know that's super simple, but that's actually, it almost sounds kind of like crazy coming out of my mouth, that God wants to use and decides to use us as his primary plan. I mean, if I was God, I'd go with a different plan. I, I, I mean, why use me? No offense, why use you? It's like I, I, God could get it done probably a lot better without me for sure, but that is the A game. That is what uh, he is up to, working through others. How does he bring um, his forgiveness and salvation to, to most people through somebody else. I know there are times that God will work around someone and he'll, he'll just do something super miraculous. We love those kinds of times. But typically he works through uh, people, his people, Christians, children of God, because he is in them. That's an important concept of God's space that, that wherever we are as Christians, that is God's space because he's in us and he's wanting to do his good work through other people all around us to create spiritual conversations and to care and to, and to love. And so uh, we have been uh, in this series and we have six topics, six symbols as you can see here. A couple of weeks ago we started with the heart and how really before God can do anything through us, he first must work in us, on our hearts. That is so vitally important uh, because the heart's the heart of the matter, always. And so how our motive and how our love and seeing, seeing people the way Jesus sees people and seeing this world, God, God does want to bring healing. He does want to help people. He does want to bring salvation. And he's going to do that through us. And he's going to do that if our hearts are uh, aligned with his. And then that leads to the eyes, the noticing. We talked about this last week. And how if our hearts are right, then our eyes are going to see. And, and this has been a great week. And life groups and all the conversations about noticing, the stories that we've been hearing about noticing. And, and then that next step that we're going to talk about today and then all of next, this next week in our life groups and in your reading is the serving. Because if we see it, if our, if our hearts are there and if we see that need, then we're able to actually step out and then we become the, the answer to that prayer. We become the means by which God uses to, to meet that particular uh, need. So this week, if you're journeying with us in this series, we've been providing books called God Space. Um, and there's a small stack that remain over here. If you have been gone for a couple of weeks, you're wondering what this is all about. We have a book to kind of supplement this series as we go through it together. Awesome book. And you can pick up one of those. We've also put a workbook together that has questions for each of these six uh, weeks on these six important um, symbols and the key topics that they represent. So this week, you're reading chapter four on serving. And then in your life group, 
it's actually the third uh, lesson serving. So, and if you're not in a group, well then please join uh, just individually or with your family uh, throughout uh, the week as you go along uh, with us. Serving is our topic today. We are in the community for the community. We talk about that all the time. And one of the great scriptures that I think represents a beautiful picture of what it means for us to be active in the community is way back in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 29. And and so I'm going to share that with you. We're going to move through the first 13 chapters. But first I need to set the context of what's going on. Like what, what in the world's going on back there at Jeremiah 29? Well, it's about 600 B.C., and the Babylonian Empire was the world power. And Nebuchadnezzar, the empire of that huge nation, sent an army to conquer Jerusalem. Israel, kind of a little dot of a nation, but it was sort of the next stop on the conquer tour. And Jerusalem was, was sacked, and the temple was destroyed. And what Babylon did, and they would often do this as part of their strategy, is they would take the leaders, many of the leaders in that country that they or city that they conquered back to Babylon. So in this case, they brought uh, many of those Jewish leaders, uh, prophets, priests. Uh, they brought back uh, skilled workers, uh, court and government officials, artisans. And they were taken captive and brought back to the city of Babylon. And the reason they did that is because they were trying to sort of indoctrinate them and uproot them from their cultural distinctiveness. So they would become more Babylonian in their thinking and in their, their way of life. They did that because it would minimize the potential for uprising and resistance uh, with that conquered uh, people. So that was pretty much the strategy. And these exiles, these uh, Jewish people, the leaders, oh, and remember, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were four of these individuals that we read about in another book, the book of Daniel. So just to kind of set some historical context there. When the exiles arrived, they were given a good amount of freedom to... Um, to live and to settle there in the area. And so what the Jewish people did is they settled outside of the walls of Babylon. They didn't want anything to do with those people. And this is understandable. They hated them. They hated what they were doing or what they had just done to their country. They also knew the strategy to try to assimilate them into their culture. And they didn't want anything to do with that either. Oh, and another reason for the resistance to live outside the city is because there were false prophets, and Jeremiah talks about it in chapter 28, that were predicting that two years, only two years, and the Jewish people would be brought back by the Lord. And that was a false prophecy. So that's the backstory. Then they get this letter from the prophet Jeremiah. It was absolutely shocking. So let me read it, 29.1. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. It said, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and the diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. And this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And those last verses are familiar to a lot of us. Well, this is where they come from. That's the context. Shocking letter that they received. How they were supposed to relate 
to this wicked, idolatrous, foreign uh, group of people that has just conquered them. And so this letter gives the big idea. It gives the big idea for them and for us. So, So here it is, big idea. We are in the community for the community, and this means three things. Number one, to willingly settle here, don't separate from the culture. So we read that in verse five, build houses, settle down, plant gardens, eat what they produce, marry and have sons and daughters and find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters, increase in number there. So, so God's like, hey, stop distancing yourselves, stop isolating, make this home, settle here, plant, raise children. You've left a place where everybody was pretty much like you. Now you're in a place where like nobody's like you, but settle down here and make it home. Now we might say, well, wait a minute. What does this have to do with us today? This is like the Jewish people exiled to Babylon, 600 B.C., What does it have to do with us here today? I suggest everything. And the reason is because the New Testament calls us as Christians exiles. That we are foreigners and strangers in this world. Ambassadors. And it's easy for us to forget this. But this is who we are. In fact, that word exile means resident foreigner. A resident, not a tourist. Not someone who shows up for just a few months or a couple of years, but can't wait to get out of here. Not some disgruntled, I've got an address here, but that's about it attitude. No, someone who has uh, gladly, willingly settled here. That's very interesting because in verse 1, who does it say carried the Jewish people into exile? Nebuchadnezzar, right? He's the one that, that hauled them off there. But, but wait, what does verse 4 and verse 7 say? God took them there. So which is, which is true? Both are true. God used Nebuchadnezzar to bring his people, Jewish people, and there's a whole backstory there where there was idolatry and immorality and a lot of stuff that God was needing to discipline And it was a 70-year timeout. (laughs) It was a 70-year discipline period. And and his people changed. And and that's a whole other story. Uh, But God is is basically uh, saying, I brought you here. I'm going to work in you. I'm going to refine you. I'm going to change you. Oh, and also, we're going to make this city better together. I'm going to use you to bless this place. Yes, this wicked Pagan, idolatrous city. Same is true here in Grants Pass. And I'm not sure how you feel about our city. Some of you may love it. Some of you, uh, the opposite. Some of you maybe don't know how you got here. The bottom line is, you're, you're here. God has you here. And he's saying, settle. Like for as long as he has you here, settle here. Don't separate but be a part of what's going on here. Number two, he says respectfully resist here. Don't assimilate into the values of the culture. So don't compromise or give in to the values of the city. And and verse six suggests this because he he says uh, multiply here. Uh, Increase in number. In other words, keep your and grow your Hebrew identity. And of course, that was at that time, they were God's people. Verse 12 and 13, you will call upon me and come and pray to me and you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So God's like, remember, you're mine. Like like my values and what I desire for you is what matters most. Okay, I am your ultimate king and God, all right? Yeah, I know Nebuchadnezzar brought you here, but, but don't Don't compromise those values and those convictions that I want you to be about while you're living in this city. It's perfectly illustrated in Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you want to read a case study on it, it's Daniel 1, where they come in and they they are told that they're going to change and they're going to do things that the Bible uh, 
the, the Bible forbid them to do and to go in a way that was opposite the direction God wanted them to go. And so they resisted and they were blessed because of it. That's a whole other story. It's a great story. But God blessed them because they didn't compromise on biblical values. This is hard, you guys, because we live in this culture and it's easy to do the things and think the way that the culture uh, is. God says, no, no, no. Yes, live here, make it home, settle here, but, but you know what? Don't assimilate to the values that are here. And it's, it's really best summarized in that word ambassador, that we're ambassadors for Christ. I mean, think about what an ambassador does, right? An ambassador uh, represents country A in country B. So the ambassador uh, takes the, the agenda and the values of country A and brings those to country B where, where he or she lives. And, 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 and that ambassador cares about country B and should and tries to build bridges and to make connections and to really take those uh, uh, values of country A, their home country, into the country they are ambassador to. Beautiful picture of the Christian life. So what's country A for us? Heaven, right? Heaven. And in fact, that's our true citizenship. Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven, right? In every city that, that we might live in or Christians might live in in this world, the group of Christians is the city of God, all right? It's heaven.gov. In every city of the world, those believers that are there. And that's what Jesus meant in Matthew 5 when he says you're a city on a hill. So there's, there should be something special about you that, that you should shine brightly, but don't give in to those values of the, the culture that contradict the values of, of God. Now, there's many examples of this. Let me just give you one of a value in our culture that is an absolute contradiction to the cross of Jesus Christ. And that is, especially Western culture, all about the individual self. All about me and what I want and what makes me feel good. And self-assertion, self-definition, self-gratification, self-preoccupation, right? It's all about the self. And as long as it's working for us, it's good. But it's not working for us anymore, we're out. It's pretty much how, how it goes. Now, I, I wish more of us would be, would be honest about the consequences of that value system brokenness, broken relationships, body parts everywhere. I mean, it's just so tragic because of this me first uh, mentality. Whenever there's me first, relationships will always struggle and be blown to smithereens. Marriage, for, for example, the most intimate of all uh, relationships. I mean, if one or both spouses says, me first, the marriage is doomed. Okay, but, but if, if both are saying, you first, if each spouse says, you before me, my life for yours, well, then that marriage is in for years of fullness and blessing. Jesus came into this world, and Jesus wasn't a me first person, right? Yes, he was God, and yes, he desired worship ultimately, but he came in and said, you before me. He's a guy who lost his life so that we can live. My life for yours. Self-sacrificing love. So, friends, that's a value system that, that we should share and be glad to, to, to do so under God's help. That's completely different than what our culture uh, is, is all about. That's just one example. Many, many different examples that we could talk about. We don't have time, but I mean, Christians, because we're God's people, we're going to do money differently. We're going to do sexuality differently. We're going to do work differently. We're going to do relationships. Differently. And it's not because like we're, um, we're better. It's not because like we're, we're um, holier than now. It's because Jesus saved us. Okay. Jesus has changed our lives. And, and, and so um, our whole worldview is different totally because of the Lord. Okay, so settle here, but don't 
live the values here, resist the values that are here. And then the third thing, I'm going to share this verse and then I'll give you the point. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. That's an awesome verse. Number three, sacrificially love here. Don't despise the culture. Don't be selfish. What's being asked? Seek the peace and prosperity of the city. One Hebrew word, shalom. There is no English word that comes close to defining the power and the beauty of shalom. Shalom is a holistic prosperity, physically, emotionally, relationally, uh, spiritually, of course. It's health in every, every single uh, aspect. And notice what he's saying here. Seek the shalom of that city. Oh, they had been taught, seek the shalom of Jerusalem. That had been ingrained in their Minds, but now they're, they're hearing, no, seek the peace and the shalom for Babylon. In fact, he says, pray for it. I want you to love this city. I want you to go to the mat for this city to try to make it a better place, a place of shalom. Guys, this is a shocking statement for God to say this about such a wicked group of people like the Babylonians. But he's saying, you know what? Pray that even your enemies prosper. And so we could take a lot of time and, and kind of break this down in the different aspects of culture, which is why we say we're in the community for the community. We hope that this is true. We hope that, that all of the at-risk kids are finding some love and some help. We're, ho- we're hoping that, that families get, get help and strengthened. We're hoping that, that, that our community's healthier, just physically. Like we rank, I think, second to last on all the health indicators. And Joseph, like we're wanting to see health improve. And we believe God cares about health. We believe God cares about work. We're wanting to see better jobs. We're wanting to see employers um, grow in their skills and to bless employees and to employ employees to try to encourage and bless their bosses and and we're wanting that we're wanting health care that 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 is a blessing for, for for and we want schools I mean we know our schools are hurting we've got some amazing teachers here in our church and many churches and coaches and volunteers and Parents, especially involved in the schools, and, and that's what's going to get the job done to bring peace, to bring a greater shalom. Like it's never going to be heaven till heaven, right? But we want to bring greater shalom, prosperity, holistically to this community. That even people, if they say, I don't want anything to do with your Jesus, thank you, but no thank you, that they would still sense, wow, this is becoming a better place to live. There's a greater prosperity and a peace here. Now, as Christians, we shouldn't be shocked by this, although it's very good to be reminded. It's easy, I'll speak for myself, to hate this place. I mean, I don't know, go down the list. You could, could, I mean, some people say, well, I hate the... Negativity. I hate all the green stuff that's growing. I hate all the, I, I, I hate the, you know, I hate city government. I hate county government. I, I, actually, I don't. But I mean, but, but there's, these are examples. Oh, I hate my job. I hate, uh, you know, my neighborhood. I mean, there, there's, there's this tendency to kind of just get disgusted by it all. I mean, we all know people who've left this community because they couldn't stand it anymore. Now, I'm not here to like argue with them or to try to talk them out of it necessarily, but it's interesting. Oh, I found heaven in Idaho. I found heaven in Tennessee, whatever. Well, okay, great, maybe you did. But here's the thing. Does it ever dawn on us that we're actually here, not just for ourselves? Like a lot of us came here because like we think the opposite. We love it here. Like you retired here. Like you could have retired many. You retired here. 
Uh, some of you, you got a job here that you appreciate. It's, I mean, it, it, no job's perfect, but it's, it's where you're at, where God has. He's brought you, it's a good place to raise your family. A lot of good things about our community. It's, and it's why, you know, potentially it's why you're sitting here in Grants Pass and not, you know, um, Des Moines, Iowa, whatever. So um, my point in, in all this is that we tend to think more personally about the benefits and the quality of life that this place means for us. I'm not even saying that's wrong, all right? Jobs, retirement, quality of life. It's pretty sweet here in many ways. But here's the thing. Maybe it's more than that. Maybe we're also here to benefit this hurting city. Maybe God says, you know what? Not maybe, he definitely says to all of us, Shalom for Grants Pass. Prosperity here in every way possible. Now, of course, ultimately, we want to see hearts turn to Jesus. That's the, that's the big goal, all right? But, but even if they don't, we want this to be a better place to live. And I hope that sounds familiar because that's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus left a great place to come here. That's a big downsize, right? This neighborhood, the emphasis on hood, especially there. (laughs) Jesus came here so that I could go there, right? And you too. I mean, it's just beautiful. It's just amazing. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So again, I I just want to remind you um, from the cover, actually Genesis 11, all the way to the end of Revelation, Babylon is always a picture of the evil and the wickedness of, of Satan's system. All right? And so God is saying, love that place. Bloom where you're planted there and bring a peace and bring a shalom. So that fires me up. That gets me excited. I'm going to close with this one verse. Uh, 1 Peter um, 3, 15. Um, Thursday night when I was teaching, I, kept, I couldn't close. I just kept talking. <laughs> so I won't do that to you. <laughs> Be ready to, this out of the out of the message translation. I love this. Be ready to speak up and tell anyone who asks why you're living the way you are and always with the utmost courtesy. So I just want to uh, leave you with that And I want to ask a question. It's such an interesting verse. The question is this. um, Whoever asks us that? And why that we're living the way that that we are? This, This verse implies that in my life and in yours, I'll speak to myself, that there should be something curious about me, something intriguing, something different than maybe the other neighbors or the other workers or the other students or the other coaches or the other parents. Again, not, we're not better, but just because of Jesus, the Jesus factor. And when has anybody seen that and when has anybody asked, what's up with you? Well, why did you do that? Why, why do you think, that, why, do you, why do you give the way you do? That's a good question. It's a convicting question, isn't it? And then to be ready to share when we're asked. And that's actually, that's a couple weeks ahead here. That's the mouth, the lips. We'll we'll get there. But it's a a great question uh, to ask. I want to close with really a favorite video of mine. You've seen it, I believe, although it's been a long time since we've shown it. it. It's an oldie but a goodie. You'll, you'll see it in some of the styles. That is a little dated. But this is such a great picture of, of the, the, the noticing and then the serving that comes after it. And then I'm going to come up and I'm going to share. We're going to end early today. Don't, don't, don't faint, okay? We're, we're actually going to be done like 10 minutes early. Because, because we have organizations here and we have River Valley Ministries set up all throughout the facility. And um, I want you to make a couple laps before you hit your car, okay? So... Um, Roll this, and I'll make a couple comments, and then we will uh, wrap up. (sighs) I 
kid, every time I'm pulling out, he's right there. Man, and someone needs to talk to his parents, <laughs> if they're ever at home. What is up with the traffic today? It's always, every day, this intersection's always crowded. I hate pulling out of here. I need some of these dumb roads. Oh, there's... Oh. <laughs> okay, so I'm not even here. Right. Great lady. The princess of parking. Oh, sure. Take the spot. Way to be considerate. Oh. Are you kidding me? Unbelievable. Oh. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, it's about time. Let's see, what do I want? Uh, yeah, could I add a cookie to that order? Yeah, no problem. Yeah, uh, no problem, only guy in the world. I'm sure you need your cookie. The world? Your oyster, and he's serving your cookies. Thanks, Thank sir. you so much. Uh -huh. What can I get for you? Uh, yeah, I'll have a tall decaf macchiato. Yeah, sure, no problem. The 385. And uh, it might take a few minutes here. We've got quite a line, obviously, and thanks for your patience. Great. Yeah, <laughs> great. Great for me. Waiting again. Unbelievable. What? What is... What is that? What in the world? What am I supposed to do? How can I how can I do anything about that? Can I even help with that? I don't your coffee, sir. Oh. I can't I can't take this anymore. I gotta get out of here. Hey, watch it. Hey buddy, come here. 